today we are going to talk about security again. Now, as always, remember there is no perfect security. It's always a balance between security and practicality. Every lock can be picked, and every type of security can be exploited and broken. Eventually, given enough time, over, under, around, or through, there is always a way. We need to look at our own threat model, see what types of attacks have the highest statistical likelihood, and mitigate those first, while making sure that whatever it is we're securing is still usable. If we try to secure against every possible attack, very likely we'll waste a lot of time, money, and be unable to use whatever it is we were trying to secure. So don't be all oh, but. What about in my comments? Yes, I know. The video is about things I do that address my threat model. Your threat model is most likely different and should be addressed differently. But maybe you can incorporate something like this. Maybe it will just give you some ideas. So let's talk about dress. Many of you have seen this great XKCD comic, A Crypto Nurse Imagination. His laptop is encrypted. Let's build a million dollar cluster to crack it. <gasps> no good. It's 4096 bit RSA encrypted. Blast! Our evil plan is void. What would actually happen? His laptop's encrypted. Drag him and hit him with this $5 wrench until he tells us the password. Got it. This is otherwise known as rubber hose cryptography. In a lot of the world, you may not really have the option of not unlocking your device if you are told to. Basically, encryption protects your data only so long as physical measures, aka dress, can't be used against you to force you to decrypt it. If you leave some place, the state can just lock you up until you give them the password, or if gangsters want to torture you into transferring your cri cryptocurrency. You are out of luck, and you have to plan for that as part of your threat model. In some cases, direct keys that offer access to dummy data can help. You type in a password, and it gives access to data that is less important, but maybe they'll believe it's all you have. But if it's the recovery keys to your cryptocurrency wallet, that won't help you, because they can verify a transaction on the spot. There are a few things you can do, but the one we are going to implement today is visible data destruction. And again, it's not perfect, but it may be appropriate in some situations. Say you have an encrypted USB stick. If it looks like dress is imminent, you destroy the data in a visible, slightly theatrical, but still very safe way. You have a copy of that data somewhere offsite, out of reach, like with your lawyer or in a bank vault. The idea being to convince your attackers that you could not give them the data even if you wanted to. If it's cryptocurrency, convince them that the only copy of your wallet keys on the side has been destroyed, and the only backup is with your lawyer or in a safe deposit box somewhere. No, we aren't going to use Thermite. That's a good way to get in a whole different kind of legal trouble. And automatic mechanical destruction, like a cr crusher or a drill press, is a little expensive and introduces a level of complexity that could make it less reliable. So we are going to do it the cheap way, by running AC mains voltage through the data pins of the USB drive, and we are going to build a little box to make it quick and easy to do it. Now, a little warning before we get started. This is incredibly dangerous. We are working with mains wiring. You could easily burn your house down this way, and this is only something to consider if the threat you are mitigating is worse than burning your house down or going to jail for tampering with evidence and obstruction of justice. Because yes, destroying evidence this way can be really bad. I'm not telling you to do it, because it can make things worse. I'm telling you how to do it in those rare cases it's called for. Most of you really should not do this. But 
you, you know where I live, so can understand why I might, in theory, have set up a little something like this lying around. So here's a little prototype that shows you what we are doing. Do not make this. You'll kill yourself and it will hurt the whole time you are dying. We've got an AC plug on one end and two wires connected to the center, two connectors of this USB adapter, pin two and three. Now you can just wire this up to a normal USB socket well, you can, but just once. Every time you use it, it melts the socket where it connects to the USB drive and you'd have to solder on a new one. So this little green connector is an easy way to make the device reusable. Okay, I've got it all set up. But just to be safe, I'm going to turn it on over there. So this is a new one right out of the packaging and this is the one we just went the main voltage to and it's in pretty rough shape. What I want to do is have all four data pins connected to the computer but be able to disconnect those four and connect the middle two to mains wiring quickly wherever I want. Now, I could make a PCB to do this, but this works best if it's very clear to whatever mid-head just kick down your door exactly what just happened. So, a little bit of drama to ensure that even the person who isn't very technical can see what you've done is very useful. It's not enough for the data to be gone. You really want to sell the idea, so they give up on beating it out of you and cut their losses. I want to make absolutely sure that it's right before May, that the USB drive's connection to the computer's USB port is disconnected before the mains voltage is connected to the USB. Otherwise, I could send mains voltage straight to the computer and fry the board. I've designed a simple little case and I'm going to laser cut it in clear acrylic on my Quaker Cloud RF. Again, so pretty much anyone with a crew about computers can see exactly what happened. All right, we're in Lightburn again. This is the plate I'm going to cut. Let's take a look at the settings. The speed is 15 and max power is 1990 passes two. Okay. Let's uh, put the material in the laser cutter. I'm going to use the clear acrylic. Let's frame it.
Now let's put the USB in. You can see on the screen, test USB. But if I'm working away, I can see all my files. Someone suddenly tried to knock down the door. Okay, push it back. Now you don't see the USB on the list. That means it's dead. Now you can recover data from some pretty amazingly damaged hardware. So could a nation state actor recover this? I don't know for certain. I burnt out a USB drive and a micro SD card like this and sent them to the best recovery place in Shenzhen. They have a reputation for being able to pull anything off anything. No luck. Then I sent it to recover myflashdrive.com in Massachusetts. They have a reputation as being one of the best recovery places in the US. They said no go and could not recover anything. But you should use them anytime you need recovery services for anything normal because they were really, really good sports about all this and very nice about the whole thing. Their contact information is in the description box. Now, this isn't actually the best way to implement it. It's just a simple way to show the basic concept so you can run with it and tailor it to your own needs. If you are accessing the USB stick when they kick down your door, the data is resident in your computer's memory. In fact, that's one of the potential ways to defeat this. We'll reject another time. But for now, consider a circuit that both kills power to the computer and sends power to fry the USB stick at the same time. You can do that with simple circuit board. If you want, even a giant switch like this with a lot more poles. The other thing is, you don't really want it activated by something you have to do. What if you are in the bathroom? You want it activated by something they don't do. That could be a switch on the door that has been disabled, or a laser chip wire to step over or under. Get creative. If you search AliExpress for escape room, they have tons of ingenious ways you can act activate or deactivate it. Just make sure that it's something that's fast and easy or you'll just disable it, and something you won't forget or you'll go for a lot of drives burning them all out. Finally, before you go off in the comments about how you're sure this company or that agency can recover it, maybe we don't know for sure. If I were a government agency, I would certainly spread the rumor that we could recover anything from anything to, destroy, to discourage people from trying. So far, at least places that ordinary consumers have access to can seem to recover a droid destroyed in this way. Talk is cheap. So I propose the following. If your company tries and can recover data from a regular Sandix Cruiser 16 gigabyte USB drive that has had 220 volts run through the data pins for 10 seconds, and you send me some evidence at this email address, I'll mail you one with a keyword save on it in an ordinary text document. The first company that tells me that keyword, I'll do a follow-up video telling everyone your company recovered it. And I'd love to show everyone a little video of the process if you make one. I know it will probably be expensive, so I'll try to make it worth your while. And I think everyone will agree that if you can put it off and recover data of a dry destroyed disk in this way, you deserve some recognition. That's it for today. Hope you enjoyed this type of video. In this case, even though I can do it, you probably should not, and be glad you don't have reason to.